not travel to the world right now, so we're bringing the world to JCCC through our weekly Explore the World series. And so we have three main themes of the series. One is headlines from abroad where we Zoom somebody in from another country. We just talked with Tinika from the Netherlands. She is going to be speaking later on this month. I hope you will all come. We also Tina have international- also here. What? I said her colleague. Oh, and, and her colleague. Yeah, it's also here. Also here. Welcome, Welcome. Him. We also um, have a series, International Careers. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have the local Peace Corps recru recruiter speak. I hope you'll come for that. But today's series is part of the themes, JCCC Travelers, where we have employees of JCCC who have traveled to a target continent, and three of them will speak, which means we all get very little time to tell you about our adventures, which we are going to do today. So three of us are speaking. Um, we are speaking in alphabetical order by first name, which means my colleague Brooke will speak first. And go ahead, Brooke. All right, let me share my screen real quick. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, I am starting off this conversation. So I thought the first thing I would do is kind of address where we're talking about um, Africa. Thank you, Google Maps. Um, so we are not covering the whole entire continent. Um, that would be amazing, but we don't have time to do that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about South Africa. Um, so that is where I spent my time. my time. And specifically, I was in Port Elizabeth, which I have highlighted down here, it's part of the Eastern Cape. Um, there we go. Um, so how I ended up in South Africa. Um, I was there July through December of 2006. I graduated from high school in 2006. So prior to going, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, I knew that I wanted to go to college, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to study. And so I thought, well, I'm not ready to yeah. commit. And so <laughs> I want to go and do something and have an adventure. Um, um, try and do something that I thought would be really productive and helpful and help guide me into what I would want to do in the future. So um, we actually had a family friend who was a co-founder of Oceans of Mercy Children's Village in Port Elizabeth. And we, I talked to him about this and he said that there could be a spot for me there at the village to um, be a volunteer. And so I decided that's what I was going to do. Um, yeah, I fundraised for the whole thing. And I boarded a plane in July of 2006 and landed in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. <laughs> um, so I spent most of my time there at the orphanage, the children's village. I was also spending a lot of time in Markman Township and Motherwell Township. Um, Motherwell being the bigger of the townships that are in Port Elizabeth. Um, if you're not familiar with what a township is, you're really going to think of as, as like a ghetto, as um, more of kind of like shanty towns. A lot of the homes that are there, I think I have a picture in one of my other slides, but a lot of the homes there um, are semi-permanent. And so they might have cement walls, but they have tin roofs. Um, they might not have reliable electricity, water, sanitation. Um, there's a lot of food insecurity there, so it's a very impoverished area. Um, so, but I spent the bulk of my time there with, at the Children's Village, and I was focused on working with the children in group sessions or one-on-one, -on -one, and it really looked like um, me just spending time, giving my time, trying to be kind of a big sister role in a way, helping with homework and um, having conversations about um, all kinds of things. I introduced some of the older girls in the village to, um, you know, beat poetry and stuff like that. We had a lot of fun. And then some of the younger girls, we did, we would act out stories and things like that. So um, it was a really great experience. This is me when I was in high school while I was there. I am pictured with two of the little girls that were there at the village who um, I loved very much and are all grown up now because this was a while ago. <laughs> um, so South Africa is a really 
interesting place because it is two different types of countries in one. So you have a first world country that has a thriving economy. It's one of the wealthiest countries in the continent of Africa. Um, it's a top tourist destination. You see beautiful images coming out of there. They have awesome beaches. Um, major surfing competitions take place there. They're, um, so it's definitely on the world stage. But then there's another half of South Africa that is more of what the majority of the population is experiencing. And that's the third world side of the country. Um, this is not a hard thing to see, especially if you are a tourist or a visitor there. Um, I think that people that grow up in South Africa, because it's so normal, it's not something that they notice. Um, our friend, Sean, who's a white South African, said that he didn't notice the poverty until he had lived in America and then gone back to his home country. And that's when he saw the poverty and that's what led him into helping to found this children's village. Um, so I, as a white American woman, was living kind of in between these two things, seeing a lot of the white African culture and how they lived um, and went about their lives, and then also the black African culture and how they lived and went about their lives. And that's where I spent most of my time. So um, my top picture here is of Mama Gladys. She was the woman that was in charge of the orphanage that I lived and worked at. And um, she adopted me into her family. I actually am wearing um, a traditional Kosa necklace and dress that she had made for me as part of um, being part of her family. So that was really touching. <laughs> um, and then part of what we did in the townships was we were helping to establish a child sponsorship program. So this was the very beginning of that sponsorship program. Um, the image on the bottom left-hand side of the truck, that is 15 food parcels that we have in the back of our truck that we're delivering. The picture in the center there right next door is one of the, it's kind of a picture of one of the recipient's homes. So you can see that there's a house there. There's kind of like a a, a dirt backyard. There's a fence that's a little questionable, but I mean, these were a lot of the homes. We're talking probably single bedroom, multi-generational family situation. And especially when you would have a food delivery, like the image in the far right, there were a lot of family members that would show up because you would find that this food wouldn't just span to one home, one person that the child sponsored, but it would span out to other family members, which could be a positive and a negative thing, as you might imagine. Um, we also, in these townships, in Markman, the smaller one, we started up a soup kitchen. And Mama Gladys has all of these amazing connections. She's originally from the townships, and that's how she started caring for children. She found one child digging in trash. Serious story. She child was digging in trash, and she took them into their home because she knew that there were numerous children that did not have homes that were completely abandoned or their families had all died. And so she was taking children in, she was feeding them on her own money. Neighbors found out, started volunteering food and essentials to her. And then she connected with um, Sean eventually and that's how they founded the um, children's village. Um, this image from the far left, is probably the most striking image out of all of the ones that I took. This is from, I think, the first soup kitchen that we held in Markman. And this little girl, I do not know her name, but what happened was I had my my photograph, or my camera, ugh. <laughs> I had my camera, I was taking a lot of pictures that day to document what we were doing. And this little girl, her older sisters pushed her in front of my camera and told me to take her picture. And I took her picture. There were children all over the place, but she is by herself in this image. Um, I took her picture. I showed it to them. They were very happy. And they told me that my job then was to give her photo to Americans so that they could help her. Um, so that was a lot of what I was seeing in my world in South Africa. I was living with people that were at risk. And I was, but I'm also coming from Johnson County, Kansas. You know, I'm coming from a place of um, racial and socioeconomic privilege. And so it was a very eye-opening experience for me as um, 
my just graduated from high school self, um, I would highly recommend going to South Africa. Anyone who I run into that says, oh yeah, I'm all about it. Um, I'm all about it. I'm also all about seeing what the whole of South Africa looks like. It's a beautiful full place to tour. Um, I did go on a safari that while I was there. It was fantastic. Um, but it's also really good to know like more that fuller picture of the country that you're in, not just see the beautiful side, but also see what it's like to really live in that place. Um, so I'm a big proponent of that. I know that there are tours that I'm, I don't have one to promote, but I know that there are tours available and ways that you can connect into the greater parts of South African society. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, I know our study abroad office <laughs> offers study abroad opportunities in South Africa. So it's definitely something um, to connect with. But yeah, it's an amazing country. It was very, um, it was a very life changing experience. So that's all I have to say right now. On to Jeanette. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Brooke. Um, I'm going to stop sharing her screen and I am going to share mine because I am going to. Uh, never mind. This is always the problem. All right, here we go. Back to I am going to share my screen about my experiences in Kenya and Uganda. So I did see, I was there in 24 trips in 2011, 2013, 2014, and 2016. And I did see large animals. So I wanted you to see that. But the reason I saw large animals was because I went to the national parks in both countries. They're not just out touring about, which some people think. Here's where Kenya is. I was not in Nairobi or in Mombasa. I was along Lake Victoria in a couple of villages. So that's really important for you to understand, just like Brooke talked about the context of her experience where she was. My experience is village life in the west of Kenya. And if you were in Nairobi, which uh, Professor Hardy is gonna talk about, his experience I'm sure was quite different of Kenya. I was there with a US 501c3 that provides some of the support for two orphanages out there. And there were just so many orphans. Um, one school had about 500. The other had when I was there about 175. Such a small area with so many children who have lost either one or both parents. You know that kind of trauma has to have an impact on the future generation. From what I could tell, there were probably three main reasons why there was so much death, and that pervasive death really impacted me my first trip to Kenya. But the three reasons, two of them were sort of old reasons, lack of access to medical care and malaria, because we were in a malarial zone. But the third reason was a new one, HIV AIDS, um, which is in the heterosexual population in Africa, as you know. In this area, most of the men go somewhere, or many of the men go somewhere else to find jobs. And so if they're gone 10 months a year, it's easy for them to bring HIV AIDS home to their wife. Um, polygamy makes it worse. And so then you end up with so many orphans. Um, the sadness became real to me after my first trip. The woman here in the middle was one of the teachers that I got to know. She was maybe the kindest to me. I didn't even know she was pregnant because apparently in that culture, you don't talk about pregnancy. Well, two months after I returned, I got an email that she had died of preeclampsia. And how many of us know an American who's had that, an American uh, pregnant woman, and we survive, but there she and her baby died. This little girl was her older daughter. And when I returned to the schools in 2013, I asked about the daughter and they called her up to see me. And I hadn't been expecting that. And I just found I didn't know what to say other than I'm sorry, I knew your mom. But on a different note, here's kind of typical housing out in the village where I live, uh, lived. I just um, sent money to Kenya to help fund one of these houses for a widow who had six children and who have just lost her house now in the recent flooding that they've had. We had to raise a total of about 1,000 US dollars. So for us, not a bad price for a house. I think for them, it's quite a bit, but pretty sustainable. 
Um, but the house where I lived was so nice. Um, the pastor who runs the orphanages is who we stayed with. Like I think I mentioned, he's primarily running on US dollars. And there are IRS rules that if you're sending money overseas, you've got to go visit the, the destination. And so he has Americans through quite a bit and he wants us to be comfortable, just like the JCCC Foundation takes care of our donors. So it was a lovely house. We had a cow who grazed on the front yard. Um, I had a nice bedroom. I had a chicken come visit me one day. You can see I slept under a mosquito net, um, no, no uh, screen in the window, but I had a ceiling fan. So if we had electricity, I was really comfortable. But my mama had a lot harder life. Once when she wasn't home, I snuck out to her areas. Here's her laundry room where she washed our dishes. Here are breakfast dishes that she's getting ready to wash. This is the security system. She primarily cooked here, I believe. I think she was using charcoal. She would sit here on this can. You can start to understand why so many women in Sub-Saharan Africa have lung issues. There are a lot of things that surprised me. I'm the Mazungu, that's the Swahili word for white person. Like this woman here that I got to know was the counselor at one of the orphanages. She's university educated, a wonderful person, dreams of visiting Dallas someday. We had a lot of fun. She had just gotten married, so I asked her about bride price, which is an old custom in that area where the groom's family has to reimburse the bride's family as they lose their daughter, um, in essence, to marriage. And so because she's university educated, her parents got three cows, seven goats, and a lot of money when she got married. And you know, that surprises me. It's the old and the new, the highly educated woman still getting the ancient custom. More old and new. You can see from these pictures I took, the combination of petrol power and donkey power, human power, this guy really can get to moving fast. Uh, the bicycles, lots of times two people on bicycles, a lot of times a woman riding side saddle um, behind. For a while in this area, after I was there, there was a law that women could not straddle bicycles, um, apparently under the theory that what would that make men think about? So I don't know, the new and the old. More new and old. I love this old house with a blue painted door. I took the picture from a moving van. I wish it was sharper. But this was our hydroelectric plant where we got our electricity from, built with Japanese money. We didn't have enough electricity. There were rolling blackouts throughout the day. Some point for four hours, you would not have power. We didn't mind it when it was in the middle of the day, but you know, when it was six to 10 at night, it was dark. But that's Western Kenya, kind of a combination of new ways and old ways and trying to find their way forward in the world. And then I went to Uganda in 2014 and 2016. Uganda's right next door to Kenya. Again, I was not in the capital city, I was up north in Gulu. And that context is really important because Gulu was the epicenter of a 30 year civil war that Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army just aimed at the local population. It's just horrible stories of abductions and child soldiers and sex slaves and it traumatized that whole culture. It's going to take them a while to come out of it. So Tom Patterson and I went there for a week to study peace building. Our office has a peace building initiative. We were doing the legwork for a grant, which sadly we did not get, but maybe someday. A lot of our meetings were in the local conference rooms, which were under trees. And really, why can't we just sit, read books and be nice to each other? But I'm not gonna tell you much about peace building there because we have a speaker that we're zooming in on Wednesday, October 21 at 2 p.m., that's Kansas City time, on the headlines from Uganda series. And it's Gloria Laker, this is Gloria. She's a peace journalist. She grew up around Gulu. She reported about the war. Now she's working with refugees and reporting on them. This is a termite mound that she's standing beside. You can see a very large one. She told me when she was pregnant, she ate mud from the termite mounds because it's good for pregnant women because it's rich in iron and they don't have a lot of protein in their diet. So I'm not gonna tell you more. Come here, Gloria. She's um, really an interesting speaker. 
So one week I was studying peace building of the six I was there, but the other five weeks I was at Lateau Hospital near Gulu, which was founded by an Italian doctor married to a Canadian doctor. They lived their entire adult lives there. They're buried on the hospital grounds. You know, one noose, noose, nurse at Lachaux Hospital has at least 50 patients. And so um, she doesn't have the ability to feed the patients, to bathe them because she's too busy. So patients have to bring their own caretakers to care for them. And here is where the caretakers um, camp out, is there in the hospital courtyard. When we were there, it was malaria season. The pediatric ward had 100 beds and we had 300 patients. Um, I walked into an office at the hospital once and um, there was a big banner on the wall that said, go to the hospital, not the witch doctor. And I thought, words to live by. My second year there, um, a sick child disappeared from the hospital and on security footage, they had a woman carrying him out and everybody was whispering, witch doctor, witch doctor. So, you know, just different issues that we've never had to face here. Our student nurses were um, attached to the nursing school that was connected to the hospital, which was why I was there. Here's daily life around the Gulu area. Lots and lots of, I, I would say the majority of the housing when I was there was probably of this type. Very sustainable. Um, this thatch roof, who knows how that was sustained because it's a specific type of grass that doesn't break down quickly. And apparently that grass is becoming very hard to find. I was inside one of these huts once. It's much roomier than I would have guessed. Um, it had upholstered furniture in it, pictures tacked up on the wall. There were cordoned off areas. So here's the sleeping area. Here's the sitting area. It was very lovely. There were babies everywhere. That's one thing I remember about Uganda, just babies everywhere. Every girl has one on her hip because, you know, if the mama has a bunch of babies, you need help from the sisters and the cousins. This little girl, I don't think was much bigger than the baby. You can see them. And there were warm welcomes everywhere. Everywhere we went, we were just dancing and singing to meet us, the traditional dances. The student nurses taught our student nurses some traditional tribal dances. And the last night that we were there, we had a big party and all the dancing and there was just so much joy. The chaplain for these nuns told me that he said, the way we survived the war, he said, was by singing and dancing. It kept our spirits up. So friends, during COVID, I offer you that to you as a possible coping strategy singing and dancing to keep your spirits up. What, because I work in the International Education Office, travelers are often telling me that their trips were life-changing and I believe them. But then I ask them, how has it changed your life? So for me, I would say there are two ways my life has really been changed by four trips to East Africa. One is I've always been concerned for economic justice, but now I'm really concerned. I realize the impact that I can have and that our nation has on the rest of the world. It impacts how I vote, as I vote for the well-being of everybody. How I give gifts, because if I have to give a gift anyway, why not give a gift created by an artisan or a woman overseas who are trying to feed their families? Like these cool cow horn earrings and necklace that I got in Kenya. I mean, how often have you been on a Zoom call with somebody wearing cow horn from their ears? If you buy from smile.amazon.com instead of just the regular Amazon site, you get the same prices, but they will donate a portion of, your, of what you spend, a tiny portion, but a portion nonetheless, to the charity of your choice. And the hospital I was at in Uganda has an American 501c3 attached to it that actually um, I can give to. But the other way it's changed my life is through friendship. When I got back from my first visit to Kenya, my neighbor told me that just around the corner from me was an African immigrant family. Now, honestly, I probably would have not had the courage um, taken the initiative to go meet them if I hadn't just returned from Kenya, but I had and I did. And they have become such good friends of my husband and me. We protested together earlier this year. Um, they are the pastors of an African immigrant, primarily African immigrant church in Lenexa. And I oftentimes go to their activities. 
uh, visit with them. It's given me a chance to continue to see the world through somebody else's eyes, to try to understand um, East African culture better, just to have a friend that I can count and depend on, to experience what it's like to not always be the white majority, but to be in the minority. It's just been so wonderful for me. And for me, that's another life-changing impact of, trip, of my trip. So that's kind of what I have. Um, I am now going to turn it over to Professor John Hardy, who also traveled to East Africa, to Kenya, and then Tanzania. So I think, John, if you want to share your screen, I hope you can. Go ahead and try. Ah, you can. I, did. I think that came up. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dr. Hardy to my students, but John Hardy to the rest of you and even my students attending today. Uh, a couple of notes uh, from the previous presentations. First of all, both Brooke and Jeanette, I loved hearing your experiences and they, they mirrored a lot of my own experiences. Uh, Jeanette, like you, my apartment that I stayed in was actually really nice. Uh, I remember explaining to my friends over in Africa that my apartment in Kenya was actually larger than my apartment in the United States and none of them could believe that but it was larger and I might even say nicer than my apartment here in the US but like you Brooke I, I, I uh, bridged or maybe spanned the two different worlds I uh, I did not live as say the poor um, uh, locals did, but I did not quite live the life of the wealthy in Kenya either. I, I was put up in university housing uh, where regular faculty members that would have been native born to Kenya, uh, where they would have lived. And my experience was it was quite nice. So I was treated well, but maybe not quite as well as like say most expats within the country. The first thing I want to start off with is what do we mean by Africa? And something that caught my attention really early on when I was going over there was if I said I was going to Africa, most, most Americans in the common vernacular assume we're talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, but really Africa is Egypt, Africa is South Africa, and Africa is uh, uh, Tanzania. All three of these areas are Africa, but what I'm going to focus on um, today is, is not just the size of Africa, and this is an interesting map just to drive home how large Africa is, but rather I'm going to be focusing on my own experiences, which pre predominantly uh, are centered on the two countries of Kenya, where I taught. I lived long enough to have a mailing address in Kenya, and then I was a Fulbright scholar in uh, Tanzania. But during that time period, I also visited Egypt as well as South Africa. But as you can see with this map, there's a lot of the African continent I'm yet to explore. So what I'm going to be discussing today are some of the takeaways I have from my experience over in Africa. Uh, these are just five general themes of memories that uh, the lasting impressions I have of my time in Africa. Speed of life, that poverty is relative, people are everywhere, much like the babies that uh, Jeanette spoke of. Uh, there's a contrast in culture, as well as some of my personal memories from my time there. One of the first things most Westerners are confronted with when they travel to Sub-Saharan Africa is the speed of life, which is very different. And even most Sub-Saharan Africans will uh, reference at least passingly of African time. If they tell you uh, to be ready to go at say nine o'clock in the morning, maybe you take an afternoon trip uh, to downtown. Uh, maybe it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Maybe it's nine o'clock in the morning or maybe you go the next day. You never quite know, but uh, as much angst as what, uh, what this initially created in myself, like uh, trying to, to bridge that gap and like wanting to keep to Western time periods. After a week or two, 
I was able to let it go. And I found myself really relaxing and really enjoying my time there. This, I went to both Kenya and Tanzania while I was working on my PhD. And that break from that high stress environment was something I found very welcoming and very loving. I, I just absolutely cherished my time there. And I first taught in Kenya, and then the following summer, I, I again went over to uh, Tanzania as a Fulbright scholar. And I remember one of the Fulbrights with me coming. She couldn't get over why I wasn't stressing about uh, things not getting done in a particular day. And I remember pulling her aside and I said, look, if you create a list of 10 items that you're hoping to do in a given day, and you get two of those accomplished, consider it a win. Uh, you just have to have different expectations. Things move at a different pace. It's not to say that uh, people in East Africa or anywhere else in Sub-Saharan Africa are lazy. It's just a different way of life. There are different priorities. If you see someone you know, you stop, you greet them, you, you uh, inquire about their family, you ask how they're doing. Uh, as Jeanette pointed out, uh, a lot of the, the um, it's not just motorized vehicles, but hand push carts or donkeys that um, bring carts into town. There's this odd mix. And so you just have different expectations, but the speed of life uh, was something that I just really cherished um, while I was over there. The second main theme was that poverty was relative. And this was something that really caught my attention. I've spent time in Central Asia as well, and, and, and the poverty there was a little different. It, it, it just, it seemed as if everyone I knew that was poor in Central Asia was just craving for more materialistic items. In East Africa, my experience was as long as, you know, you had food on your table and a roof over your head, things were relatively good. And that was something to be thankful for. Uh, what you're looking at here is what would be largely considered a middle-class neighborhood in Tanzania. This is an unplanned development. That means um, because the population is growing so quickly, this more or less, this development more or less uh, popped up overnight. But you can see the people are, are dressed in relatively new clothing. You see um, uh, signage that's painted. Uh, these are indications that this is probably middle class. Most of the people in this uh, image and those living in the surrounding neighborhood would have had meals on at least a semi-regular basis, probably two meals a day. Uh, we might consider them poor, but again, poverty is relative over there. Comparing that and contrast that to something like this, and this would be the poor of the the poorest of the poor, uh, where people are literally living out of the garbage dumps, scavenging the food that they can find in the garbage dumps, and finding a scrap metal that they can and trying to sell it to recycling centers. Uh, it's a vicious cycle for uh, people that live in these areas because once their kids are born into uh, this lifestyle, they find that um, the kids, you know, as they're growing up, they're not going to be attending school. They're going to be rummaging the garbage dumps for food and scrap metal that the family can sell. If you don't have an education, you're not going to get a job. And so then it becomes a vicious cycle. And like Jeanette said, boy, are there people everywhere. It just seems like everywhere I went, there were just always people. And yet for myself, I never felt claustrophobic. I didn't feel like I was being squeezed in but I do remember being surprised, even on rural roads, just random people walking here and there, or in a field. I was once in a um, minivan that, that worked kind of like as a, a mini shuttle bus, uh, public transportation. Uh, the driver, for whatever reason, decided that he wanted to drop us off as quickly as possible, and so he cut through a field and there were people in this field and people were literally jumping out of the way. Um, it was the most insane ride I've ever had in my entire life. And when we got to the bus stop, everyone, including myself, got out. I had no idea where I was in the city, but I knew I didn't want to be in that vehicle anymore. Um, kind of a funny side note, I, it was my first 
time traveling into the city center, the Nairobi city center by myself. And once we started cutting through this field, field um, hitting large bumps and literally catching air in this minibus, I, I, I was questioning, is this how it normally is? And I remember turning around and sure enough, there was this, this older lady in the back seat just behind me and she was praying as hard as she could. And I knew this was a little unusual. But um, yeah, people were everywhere. Uh, it seemed everywhere I went. Uh, contrast and culture. And this is something that both um, uh, Brooke and Jeanette touched upon. You see this contrast between the old and the new everywhere you go. You see modern skyscrapers in the, in the major cities. This is in Dar es Salaam, uh, the largest city in Tanzania, the, the former capital. But then if you look at the fishing boats, they're in the foreground, they're more traditionally built. Uh, you see people in traditional dress, but you see people wearing Western business suits in the downtown area as well. It's this odd mix that you just can't escape in Africa. And then for my personal time there, uh, I'm going to focus primarily on uh, my experience in Kenya, but this is the campus I taught on. And I remember initially when I was going over there, my students, uh, because I was teaching as a PhD student at uh, Kansas State, at K-State, a lot of my students were concerned about my well-being. They're like, oh, you're going to Africa. I'm like, really, it's not going to be that bad. And once I got back, I had the pictures to prove it. This was the campus I taught on. Uh, this is the administration building, and literally to, to walk to the administration building, you had to walk through these rows of flowers. Walking out my back door to, from my apartment on campus, and one interesting contrast with uh, American universities, in East Africa, typically the faculty live on campus, but the administration lives off campus. Here in the U.S., it's oftentimes flip-flopped where a university president lives on campus, they have a president's mansion, whereas all the faculty live off campus. So I lived on campus because I was faculty. I would step out my back door and this was my walk to work. Uh, my office was on the second floor, as was my classroom that I taught in. And on the flip side of the building, um, there was a national park that separated us from downtown Nairobi. And so sometimes I would look out my office window and I would literally see giraffes walking by with the Nairobian um, skyline in the background. It was just absolutely amazing. But if I'm quite honest, uh, what I remember the most and what I cherish the most are the friendships that I developed. Uh, in part because of the slower speed of life, the slower pace of life, maybe I should say, uh, you were allowed the time to really get to know someone. Um, this was my group of peers that I largely hung out with when I was in Tanzania. Um, the, the young lady on the far left um, of the photo is uh, Liza Dunn. She was over there as a Fulbright Scholar as well. Uh, and these are four of our friends that we became very, very close with. Clifford, who I'm standing right next to, just sell, just had his birthday uh, last week and I was able to send him a birthday message on Facebook and was able to do so in Swahili, my broken Swahili. And um, I just genuinely miss that, that friend of mine. He was, he was a graduate student in architecture at that time. Again, I was a graduate student myself. I was um, working on my uh, PhD in geography. He was working on a master's in, in architecture. And I remember his graduate project was to design a movie theater, and yet he had never gone to see a movie in a movie theater. And so Liza and I decided, you know, let's treat him. Um, and so we got together and we, we made a night of it, and we were able to treat Clifford to that movie. And this is something I, I brought up in the birthday wishes that that movie is one of my fondest memories of our time together. We just laughed really, really hard. It was a comedy that we saw. We had a great, great time. And then it, for my time in Kenya, this is the group of friends that I really got to know. I was there for an entire summer and I just miss these guys so much, uh, especially the three men. 
Uh, Reggie on the far left, Oliver is sitting next, or excuse me, uh, Gift rather, is sitting next to me, and then Oliver is on my left there, or the far right of the picture. These three men were uh, three students at the college, the university I was teaching at, and we became really, really, really close uh, just about every single night, almost without exception, we spent time together. And one of the differences between American universities and Sub-Saharan African universities, at least in East Africa, is that in East Africa, students oftentimes show up at a professor's house. I was made aware of this very early on and I don't know, I, I just didn't have a problem with it. It was something I ended up cherishing. They would show up at my house and it was almost like they wanted to learn from me uh, through osmosis, like just being close to me. Could they learn something from me? If, if I'm a professor, how might they learn from me? How might they mi mimic my life? And that, that kind of puts you up on a pedestal, but at the same time you realize your, your words and your actions have, uh, you have a, a responsibility to, to watch your words and act accordingly, uh, that they have power. Your words and your actions have power. They carry weight, in other words. And yet they weren't afraid to ask me tough questions and they might even disagree with me, but there was something about how they went about disagreeing with me, which didn't necessarily come up that, all that often, but they did so, so respectfully that I knew that they still cared for me, that they still respected me. And so we could have these very in-depth uh, conversations. And gosh, I miss those three guys. And every single night, again, almost without exception, we would make coffee and we would pop some popcorn. And if we weren't hanging out in my apartment, this is in my apartment, that's my couch, that's my coffee table in my apartment. We weren't hanging out here. Uh, there was a large gazebo, gazebo in the uh, central plaza of campus. And we would go there and watch a movie or watch uh, some soccer matches that would be played on the TV at night uh, with the other students. But uh, this is really what I cherish more than anything are those relationships that I built during that time period. And I'm, I'm very thankful I'm able to at least lightly stay in touch with these, these friends. But uh, yeah, more than anything, the relationships that I miss from Africa. Thank you, Professor Hardy. Um, it is time. We have about 15 more minutes just for discussion. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We would love to answer them. You can address them to a specific person. You can just address them in general, but um, we would love to talk with you. I will just say one thing I noted about all three of our presentations was that continuing influence on relationships. Um, Brooke, who has that lovely dress, um, maybe you should show us that necklace, Brooke, that dress. It's the traditional outfit that- um, Yeah, this mom. is, yeah, this is, so this is the necklace. Um, this is all handmade. And then this is the shirt and then I have a full length skirt too. Um, and this was all um, custom made for me by um, one of Mama Gladys's friends in the township. So, yeah. so just that, that emphasis on relationship. I have often said I thought that what Sub-Saharan Africa, at least my experience of it, is rich in is relationship. And perhaps if our two cultures would kind of meld together, man, we would be a powerhouse. Um, Professor Gully asks, will there be other peace journalism trips to Uganda? Well, right now there is nothing planned, but you know there could be something planned. Um, Professor Hardy and I had actually talked at one point about a study abroad trip maybe to Kenya. Um, there are definitely options, so we should talk sometime. It's a fascinating part of the world. It really but is. and. Unfortunately, I, I think Brooke and Jeanette would both back me up on this. Yes, there are a lot of tragedies that take place within Sub-Saharan Africa, but we oftentimes don't hear the stories of just how good life can be in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good that can be found there in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
My experiences with the Kenyan immigrant community is that especially new immigrants, they come just thinking that they will have, have arrived in the promised land because we have so much good stuff, you know, but after they've been here for a while, they are very lonely because we have good stuff, but we're perhaps poor in relationships because we're all sitting in our houses with our air conditioning, going in and out of our garages with our cars. And, you know, it's hard to even get to know the neighbors. Other questions? What, what do you wish you would have done while there? Brooke, John, you wanna take a stab at that? Seeing both of your pictures, I wish I would have taken more pictures. I just don't take that many pictures. Uh, you know, what was my apartment like? Uh, what was my bed like, you know, with the mosquito netting? Um, I, I took pictures of my office and, I don't know, workspace, but uh, that was it. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe better contact information to stay in touch with some of the people over there. Yeah, I, um, I did take more pictures, but unfortunately I don't have access to them. <laughs> They're on an old computer that I no longer have the power cord for. So I'm going to have to figure out how to dig into that another time. But um, yeah, I think for me, one of the things that I wish I would have done, which I guess is more of like a personal thing, um, when I was at the house, the, there were about 15 or so total children that lived there. Um, the orphanage has now expanded, so there are even more kids, and they're in a different location now. But um, while I was there, I really wish that I, um, we had a group of girls that were around 15 to, I want to say 12, that um, every Friday they would get dressed up, and they had nowhere to go. And so I really wish that um, I would have provided them like an opportunity, taken them out somewhere and just had a girl's night. Um, so that's more of a personal thing that I really wish I would have done. Um, but I think outside of that, just in general, um, I wish I would have done a little bit more traveling. I did get to go to Cape Town for a week, but it was, um, we were trying to help one of the children get a visa. Um, unfortunately, we did not get that visa so that he could come and get medical um, aid in the US, but um, so we went to Cape Town for that, but our whole trip was pretty much absorbed in that mission. <laughs> so I remember spending part of a day at the beach, but it was like super windy. The wind was coming right in from the ocean. and It was so uncomfortable, <laughs> but more traveling would have been fun while I was there, yeah. So Tom asked what the big, biggest challenges are traveling in Africa. And from, I, from my standpoint, I would say, first of all, it's a long flight to get there. Um, mm -hmm. I hear people complaining about flying to Europe and I just kind of laugh because you fly to Europe and then you get on an even longer flight to go down into Sub-Saharan Africa. Another thing is they just don't have gas stations and McDonald's under you know every few miles. And so figuring out a spot to go to the bathroom can be tricky for a woman. Um, you know, for men, all of God's green earth seems to be available as a porta potty. But for women, it's just a whole lot tougher. It's that kind of, you know, not remembering, don't drink, and that kind of thing. And also, I had no trouble with my stomach in Kenya. I think my mama was really careful about that. But in Uganda, I figured out that almost everything was either fried or boiled, and everything fried was being fried in palm oil. And I realized I can't do palm oil. So just those kinds of challenges. Um, what else would Brooke and John say? Um, I think, so Port Elizabeth is a little different because Port Elizabeth is a city. Um, so where the children's orphanage, it, it was on the outskirts of the city. It wasn't inside of a township. So I'm sorry if I gave that impression, but um, it was on the outskirts of town. It wasn't in the center of town. It wasn't too hard to get to town, but there was only there were only two people at the time that were living um, at the orphanage who were able to drive, and I was not one of them because I don't know how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> so <laughs> that was one of my difficulties um, with um, township. So 
if I had wanted to go to the township, that is a completely different story. Navigating Port Elizabeth as a white female by yourself, um, really not a problem, you know, uh, pretty normal. But if you were wanting to go into the township, that's a different story. Um, you would really need to have either a man go with you or you would need to be accompanied by like a black, um, a black mama, like somebody who has respect within the community so that you are um, for safety. Um, when I was there, it's 2006, apartheid ended in 94, everybody. So um, not a really long time between that, you know, legal racial separation. Um, so I did encounter um, times when people at the township actually were angry at me for being white and being in their community. Um, but it was very rare and most people don't go to the townships. So that's really, I guess, the only thing. John, any hardships? The only ones I'm, I'm coming up with right now as I'm thinking about this are pretty superficial uh, in terms of hardships. Like, uh, Brooke, you mentioned, you know, the stick shift. Well, in South Africa, I remember I was driving a car in Cape Town and they drive on the British side of the road. And I mean, that coordination is on the opposite side. And I remember killing a <laughs> car in the middle of an intersection as cars were coming on. Ugh. That, I mean, again, it was superficial. Uh, just minor things, um, really. I, I really did have a pretty good life there. Uh, my, my transportation when I was in Kenya, I took public transport just about everywhere. Uh, in uh, Tanzania, I was a Fulbright and the transportation was all taken care of. Uh, I did struggle a little bit, oddly enough, with like how I was treated as a, a white person and not in the negative sense, but rather I struggled that like there were times I would be, I could enter a store, not be questioned at all because of the color of my skin, but someone behind me who happened to be a black African would be stopped and questioned just because of the color of his skin. And this would be like, say, a, a black owned business. But the assumption was because I was white, I could be trusted. And I struggled with that. Um, that's not really a hardship, but just something that maybe I, uh, processing wise, I, I had a little bit of a difficult time with. You must have a more honest face than I do, John, because um, the stores I was around, I mean, they were searching everybody by the grocery store. Huh. They had police with AKs and it was just intimidating. Um, well, there's yeah, I, I saw police officers as well. I can't remember any with, anyone with an assault rifle, but there were definitely police officers in the, or at least security guards, maybe I should say, in grocery stores and stuff. But I don't think I was ever once stopped uh, while I was there. In fact, there was, um, I took a trip out to your neck of the woods in, in Kenya where I was um, to Kisim, Kisumu uh, on Lake Victoria. And um, I remember uh, a call, I was with a work colleague of mine and we took this short little ferry ride. And as we we're coming to port, he asked me, my colleague asked me to go talk to someone that had a car uh, to see if we could get a ride to my colleague's hometown. And the reason why he didn't want to was because he was black, but he knew as a white person, this person was likely going to trust me and think I wasn't you know, uh, going to do anything improper. And sure enough, this driver, it happened to be a female, said, sure, yeah, you're welcome to, you know, go as far as you need. And so we did. And, um, you know, that's just one such example. And yeah, again, I ran into well, just trust me more than Jeanette. I ran into a corrupt policeman out in Western Kenya that saw white people in the van and almost had our driver arrested. It was 
it was an adventure. But um, we are out of time. And so I just want to thank you all for coming next week on September 7 at 2 o'clock. It's not going to be this series, but it's going to be a peace building series. Professor Steve Youngblood from Park University is going to talk about media and uh, how giving peace a chance. And certainly in our country right now in the election season, something to think about. So you're welcome to do that. And then the following Thursday on September 17th at two o'clock, the Peace Corps recruiter will speak. So I hope you can join us again. Thanks for coming. I'm going to stick around if anybody has any more comments or questions, but feel free to go about your afternoon. And thanks, we have enjoyed uh, zooming you to Africa with us. Thanks everyone for showing up and thanks to Tom, Jeanette and Brooke for putting this together. It was a lot of fun. Thanks.